Welcome to What the Hell. Today we're going to talk about uh, the hitman's wife's, wife's bodyguard. bodyguard. I, it's so hard to say because the the first one was easy. This one is hard to say for me. I, I, I kept on having to, it's like, uh, hitman's bodyguard wife, hitman's bodyguard wife. But that was a sensational movie. And it, it in my opinion, it brought back comedy. It did. Finally. It really did. And, and the biggest <laughs> takeaway from that, besides the fact that Antonio Banderas kind of became like the new age Sean Connery, because you remember Sean Connery, it didn't matter what, what nationality he was playing. He always seemed to talk in a Scottish accent, and it was great. Antonio Banderas, he, he, he comes in there with his, his, uh, he, his, he, his, his Hispanic accent. And he was, told, he was supposed he to was, play a Greek. And he was playing a Greek. I was like... <laughs> and I'm like, okay... Yeah, I can kind of see that, you know. But the biggest takeaway from that movie for me was getting to hear Morgan Freeman say the word motherfucker. Yeah. I was like, and I looked at you, and I was like, I just got to hear Morgan Freeman say the word motherfucker. And it was so sweet. And it, it was. It, it was, was It was so badass on that one. It was. He, he's like, I'm just sitting there going, oh, my God, did, did that just happen? You know what was really messed up, though, throughout that whole uh uh, viewing of that movie, though, and this is what my takeaway was on it. We were the only ones who were, like really hardcore laughing about a lot of the scenes. It, yeah, uh, especially I mean, especially my creme de la creme of Selma Hayek going, "I swear to God, I'm gonna strap on a dildo and fuck your goddamn feelings if you don't hurry the fuck up." <laughs> I was like, "I was I was a chick now. I want to use that." I, 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 yeah, I mean. Ryan Reynolds has very few stinkers. I mean, most notably the you know Green Lantern and and Wolverine or and uh, Franken. It's some kind of. Uh, I'll I'll find it. You talk. But you know, I mean, it it had it had a lot of action in it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just the chemistry that that Samuel L. Jackson and Ryan Reynolds have on the screen, dude. It's it's. I mean, it's great. I mean, I really did. I, I enjoyed that movie very thoroughly. Um, it makes me, you know, want to go back and watch it again. And I would definitely do that um, with, without hesitation. I would be no doubt, hey, look, hey, we're going to go back to the theater and we're going to go watch this again. And I, and, and honestly, we would probably laugh harder because we, we're going to be able to pick up on more jokes. Bolt Neck. That's what it was. Bolt Neck was one of those uh, uh, crap movies. It was basically like a... Frankenstein type type deal. See now you got me wanting to go out there and find this. I wonder if it's on Voodoo. That's probably. But it was really one of those movies that, because we've been in a a, a real comedy uh, drain for the past couple of years. It wasn't just 2020. It was, it was more or less just everybody <clears throat> doing the whole. Uh, uh, it's the same guy. I just declined his call. Same guy that tried to call during the during during our sports episode. Oh, <laughs> like, dude, give me forty five minutes. I'm doing something. Yeah, but it was it was just a call. I mean, the last real good comedy that I remember was literally Deadpool two. I mean, it yeah. was Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds again. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I think Ryan Reynolds. He uh, he gives no fucks. He does, but at the same time, you know. It, I mean, it, no, his the, actual the, the, the fucks that he gives is it's about his craft. Yeah, you know, and he, and he doesn't he, try to he doesn't try to reinvent himself. And he's just doing comedy now. Yeah, and, well, and it's comedy slash action. But I, I think yeah, you know, ever since he took on the persona of Deadpool, you know, slash Wade Wilson, it's it's kind of like and that was. That it was uh, Wolverine really, Origins that he was really pissed well, off. Yeah, it he was really pissed off about. You know, I mean, we can th if, if there's anything that good that came out of Wolverine Origins was the fact that Ryan Reynolds just said, you know what, we cannot treat this character this way. And he really went after Fox Studios for years to get Deadpool made. Yeah. And when, <laughs> you remember that, that, that teaser trailer that, that came out? 
um, that was that accidentally put on was, the internet. That was accidentally leaked, and he was like, did somebody leak that? Was that me? I don't really, mm, I don't know, maybe. But, and, and it was the, f I mean, he really, he really went after it. I mean, and, 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 and you find that with certain actors. I mean, they, they find a character, they love the character, they, they know what the character is inside and out, and, yeah. and, they, and they still, they're <clears throat> able to bring something like a new dimension to that character. Like Hugh Jackman with Wolverine. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Hugh Jackman with Wolverine. Uh, well, he played that for what, seventeen years? Something like that. But I mean, you know, and and would I would I love to see Hugh Jackman come back and reprise the role just for the MCU? Absolutely, because I think that with with even the, a passing of the torch type deal. Yeah, even even if it's a, just a passing of the torch kind of a thing. But you know, I I mean. We have to understand that, you know, actors are just, they're mortals like you and I, and they're going to age, and it just gets harder and harder for them to get in shape for those roles. But I, I think that, I think with Hugh Jack, or with uh, Ryan Reynolds, rather, I, you know, we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to enjoy his films for a very long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 17 I years. Because he did it, he did X-Men 2000, and he did Logan in 2017, and that was mm -hmm. the last one, so 17 years. You know, uh, so I think he needs to come back for another three films. You know, they can re they can shoot him back to back to back, give him an even twenty, so that way we you know we can cut him a pension check and just have him go on about his way. I don't think he needs that pension check. You know what? Whatever. He still needs it, just just so we've got absolute closure. I mean, because I'm not gonna lie, I cried at the end of Logan. Dude, what made me really really cry was uh, Wolverine. Uh, uh, the one I was in Japan, Wolverine. It was just Wolverine, the Wolverine. And there is a scene in there where the prophecy chick said, you're going to die with your heart in your hand, and you come back low, and it's kind of a callback to it. And you're like, dear God in heaven, would you stop making me feel feelings? Right, because the last thing he said was, so this is what it feels like. Yes. You know, and I'm just sitting there going, I'm not going to cry. Because I'm sitting there watching it with two other dudes, you know, that, that I was friends with at the time. And I'm like, wow. Now, if you have a chance to watch that in the black and white noir format. There's dude, a black and white noir format? Yeah. If, uh, it's, 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 uh, if you bought the 4K disc or if you have it digital, if you bought, it, bought the digital 4K edition, uh, like on Voodoo, it came with, like, behind the scenes... Uh, uh, Featurettes, and then there was the Nor version. It's the entire movie in black and white. And yeah, I watched it in black and white. First chance that I got, dude. And I'm telling you, man, it that it worked. It really did. It wasn't one of these. Hey, it's just a color movie that they turned the color off on. Because you know, if you watch like the good classic black and white movies like Casablanca and stuff like that, the the black and white, the directors and the the cinematographers really worked those shadows to tell the story yeah and it it, it worked because you you had the really dark sinister it's shadows. Like clerks yeah well clerks the original clerks i mean what what brought what about brought that uh more into light and the reason why kevin smith did it because get budget yeah but it really played it it really did it, it, it i think it helped that film too but um but with with the uh, the hitman's wife bodyguard, it, it just the, just you, you got more backstory on the characters. <laughs> in fact, the Samuel Jackson's talking about how you know he he got shot in the nuts during a job, and it turns out it was Ryan Reynolds that shot him in the nuts. Yeah, and he's like, you know what? That was me that shot you in the nuts. <laughs> it's like. He's like, Motherfucker. Let me have that win. Let me have Take that the L. win. Take, Take that L. L. <laughs> Take the L. You know? I mean, <laughs> it, it was just, it was a great movie. The The writing was, was really well done. I mean, you, I think with The Hitman's Bodyguard, the original one, it, it was, it wasn't designed to be your classic definition of a blockbuster. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think that they intended to write sequels off of it, but because... Because Ryan Reynolds being who he is and because of Samuel L. Jackson being who he was, or, well, is still, we're not talking past tense, um, don't you dare do it, 2021. Don't you dare. Um, 
you know, we, uh, I, I, you know, I, I mean, it was almost kind of like a no-brainer. They had to do it. Now, without, well, I mean, without spoiling it, because I think at this point it's still early enough to where there's, you know, hey, spoilers, right? They have to write a third one just so that way they can, they can get a trilogy out of it. Yeah. You know, they have to. And, you know, uh, but it would just be kind of really cool to kind of see where they go with that. Because they really made this one more uh, more comedy on this one. Yeah. I mean, and and I think the third one can be straight laughs. I and mean, obviously they're going to have their, you know, we need to get that action fix in there. But uh, mostly, I mean, it, it you know, in true Ryan Reynolds fashion, it would have to be so incredibly over the top. I, well, I was actually uh, just now is looking at the the screenwriters for it just to see who did the uh, thing because a lot of the comedy into it, I think it was uh, it had that Deadpool esque. Yeah. And it, the guy, he just did uh, Hitman Bodyguard the first one, and yeah. he did the second one, but it's it just shows that i think we're finally ready without the cancel culture giving their two cents in yeah and people are not going to care and that was another thing that a lot of people are talking about is we're probably going to get away from the hundred thousand dollar movies oh you mean the the hundred hundred million dollar movies oh yeah uh, hundred million weekends. dollar yeah um as a matter of fact, okay, so I'm looking at the domestic gross for the weekend. Um, we had seen A Quiet Place. I, I went to go see A Quiet Place Part 2 uh, with my girlfriend, Mindy. Mm -hmm. Dude, that was an excellent movie. Was it? That, that was a great, great movie. Um, so the top three movies, Hitman's Wife Bodyguard, Wife's Bodyguard, brought in $11.6 million. A Quiet Place Part 2... Um, Went from number one to number two, uh, brought in 9.4. Uh, Peter Rabbit, two, rounded out the top three with 6.1. Um, when it made a jump from number four to number three. Now, I think that these numbers are going to, we may end up getting back to those $100 million opening weekends at some point. Um, I mean, because the theaters are just now really accepting people back. Now, um, I don't know if you noticed it, but whenever we go in to buy those tickets and you have to reserve your seats or whatever, right, they X out the suit, two seats on either side. Does it really? Yeah, they're still kind of sort of potting people out. And, you know, and I mean, as soon as we can eliminate the term social distancing from our vocabulary, I think that we'll be able to get back to those. Yeah. Um, now, when we start seeing Marvel movies really start coming back to the theater. Next week, I think. Next, uh, no, week, yeah, is it next week? No, because that comes out on the 9th, so it's like a week and a half from now, July 9th, yeah. with Black Widow. Um, we're going to start seeing those numbers start going up. Now, we may Black Widow may open up with like a $50 million weekend. I'm just going to kind of be conservative. I'm going to call the shot there. No, because they're going to open it up in China. Well, I'm talking about domestic. Domestic? Yeah, probably only. Yeah, because I'm only million. looking at the domestic box office. I don't, I don't care about the international shit. Um, I know that Avatar took the number one spot again because they could not stand to have a comic book movie be number one. So Avatar did a limited re-release for like a weekend. Yeah, that was funny. I'm like sitting there going, geez. You know, it's kind of like between the Chrysler building and the... And no, the, and the, and the, and it was uh, Endgame. Right, Endgame. And, and they re-released Endgame. They re-released so Endgame they... and they got that up over there, broke that record... And it took the number one spot away from Avatar. Avatar did a re-release, and they retook the number one spot by, like, maybe a couple million. Really? Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, it was during the whole pandemic, everybody shutting down kind of a thing. And, and honestly, I think, and they did a very limited release, so it wasn't like a nationwide kind of a thing. I think they did uh, more of an international re-release on that. But... I mean, I, I really enjoyed this movie. And it, like I said, it, it laughed. And I'm telling you, man, one thing, one movie I am looking forward to is Free Guy, another Ryan Reynolds movie coming out. Oh, yeah. That's going to be great. And it's just from the gamer's standpoint, plus it's Ryan Reynolds. Uh, and, 
He just he just has a certain delivery to his lines. Yeah. And I think it's hilarious. Well, this one this one's going to be very uh, mellow compared to his other films that he's been doing mm-hmm. here lately. Because Free Guy is literally, I mean, if you look at the trailers and everything, he's really just a normal, happy-go-lucky guy. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like... Uh, I'm still pissed off that uh, Ready Player One didn't boast out as big as it wanted. Yeah, to and there to. was talks about doing a uh, Ready Player Two and doing the sequel, but if you read the book, Ready Player Two... Is that out yet? I gotta get that. Ready Player Two is not... I think they shelved it. I don't think they killed the project. I think they shelved it because they really... I don't think that they're expecting it to perform as well as the first movie did. Uh, you are wrong, sir. Ready, Am I? Ready Player Two movie is in early stages. Oh wow. Okay. Well, maybe they gave it the green light again. But I wonder. I wonder if uh, Steven Spielberg is doing uh, directing again. I don't know. But you know, I mean, we're talking about some of those great producers and great directors. But we talk about like George Lucas, right? You know how he sold out to Disney. You know, for billions, oh, they they they're, they're of getting them back. Yeah, it yeah. was like, you know, Dave Filoni and and John Farvo. They're like, you know what? Now now that we're controlling Star Wars, we want George Lucas back. Yeah. And George Lucas actually, he did come back for he did a final season of the Clone Wars. He also did uh, uh, what would he call it? Uh, he came on to the Mandalorian. Yeah, I mean, it was a, he was a very, very small advisory role, but yeah. um, I'll tell you, one thing that I am looking forward to is the Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, series. I'm still up in... Well, I'm, I'm well they're shooting for, it around. They're shooting it in the Boston area. Like, I'm ready you know, for Boba Fett. Yeah, they, they, they need to really be careful with that one. Oh, yeah. They need to be careful be with watching. that one. Um, they need to be careful with it, you know, because... You're going to get a lot of those purists, and, and yeah, they're there. They're, they're the same people that bitch about the movies when they come out. It's like, look, you know, do I like the sequels? No, I don't. But do I think that... I don't like Disney's try. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I don't like the Disney trilogy. That's what I'm talking about, the sequels. Yeah. Um, the, the prequels, if you watch them, really pay attention. A lot of it... Yeah, it was. I mean, if you look, there is some political, you know, su- subliminal political messaging yeah. there. But I, I think for the most part, they could have done a little bit better with them. However, uh, you know, I don't hate the prequels. I don't. And I'm probably an anomaly, you know, amongst the people that we know here locally. But as far as the prequels are concerned... They're all right. I, I enjoy I them. mean, even to the extent that Jar Jar Binks... You know, it's like I had, a, I had a chick that wanted to date me, and she said her favorite Star Wars character was Jar Jar Binks. So it didn't really last that long. You know, I'm I'm not gonna yeah. lie. I will judge somebody off of the what depending their on. And there Star are some fan theories is. out there that that Jar Jar Binks was actually a Sith, a Sith Lord. Lord. Yeah, and I'm like, you know what? That that yeah, because you know he voted for <coughs> the clone army, so it was like, oh wow, I see what he did there. Okay, so Jar Jar Binks, he's a little smarter than we, he was letting on. But, um, you know, it, it... I will not play with that theory. You won't? No. You just don't want to give them the... You, no, you I'm don't not even give them that. The, you no. don't want to give that to them. Okay. No. But uh, the fact that they are going to retcon, you know, take the, the, the Disney trilogy out of canon. I mean, they're going to make it... Oh, they canon. fired her. Yeah, yeah. Well, they fired Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they needed to. They like, were trying to do it the next Albeit it was three films too late, but still. Yeah, they were trying so hard to, it was like, ah, oh, we gotta get rid of this bitch. Like, how do we do it? But we'll, we'll put her on. At first, she was a producer on another movie, and that was the last movie that she was gonna do. But they just, after Mandalorian, uh, John Favreau and uh, uh, Dave Filoni, they just are like, these guys are coming in and. And dealing with it. Oh, they're hiring George Lucas? Oh, oh, they're smarter than you, bitch. That's basically all it was. Yeah, well, I mean, 
I mean, there, there's literally, there's, there's this guy that has like, he has, wears a mask, and well, he there has... is, there is a lot to be said for the fact that you know, you, you get that, that hashtag that was trending for a while there, get, get woke, go broke. I think that that's yeah. exactly what was going on. Is that Kathleen Kennedy was trying to bring the woke message to, to the Star Wars universe, which and should it, be like Trump down. It. it... I mean, at its core, Star Wars is it's it's a World War Two movie in space. Literally, that's what it is. Yeah, you know, but I mean, the thing of it is, is that we can't. I mean, it's bad enough that comic book studios are trying to politicize their, you know, their 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 characters. They stopped that during. Uh, uh, they literally stopped that after a couple of episodes this year, on some of the uh, CW uh, shows. Yeah, they just like, like oh, we're not doing this anymore because we're just going with the story. Yeah, I mean, stick to the storytelling, <laughs> stick to the development of the characters. And their and first, it, it, their, their it's, first it, it's, development was uh, Superman and Lois, and that's actually I've I've been I've been catching it up, uh, catching up on it, and it's pretty decent. The only thing I don't like about it right now mm-hmm. is they're saying that uh, Clark Kent has a brother. Uh, half brother. Well, the how they can play that off is that all of these all of these DC TV shows, uh, they're all multiverse aligned anyway. Yeah. You know, and it's like me. I I personally I enjoyed Arrow. I loved Arrow. Oh yeah. It was great. It was a good series. Um, I didn't like the third season though. Well, I mean Stephen Amell though. I mean anytime I see him now, <laughs> I mean, that's Oliver Queen, for me. Um, now I did enjoy the bro- or the movie that he and his cousin Stephen did, uh, Code Eight. Oh yeah, that was very that was a good. great movie. Yeah, but, I was so happy that it came out. Yeah, it, I it, I was I helped I I contributed to the crowdfunding. Oh really? On that, yeah. When they were doing that Indiegogo or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, you know, because that's cool, you know, because I mean, he was riding that whole Arrow wave. Yeah. And Stephen Amell was part of the Flash crew, because he was the original. Um, Crap! What was his name? <sighs> We're gonna catch all kinds of hate. I can't remember the name of the character. It was uh, him and Victor Garber. They 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 originally were the two um, when they joined together. Oh, uh, uh, Firestorm. Firestorm. Thank you. Thank you. God. God. It was right there. I couldn't like. I wanted to say Inferno for some reason, but uh, when he when he killed off when he when he jumped the shark and. They, they had him write his character out um, so he can go off and do other projects. He and Steven really kind of got together and were like, we want to do this movie. And so it, they couldn't get any of the studios to buy into it, so they went and did the crowdsource thing for it. And they raised enough money to get, you know, the, the movie through pre-production. And I, I think they, I forget what studio it was that they ended up getting to buy into it, but I think it did really well. Um, and it, and it told, and it told the story to a finality, you know, and it was, it really, I think it did a lot of, uh, justice to what the story was that they were trying to tell. And, uh, you know, it, Code 8 just worked for them and it was, you could tell it was raw, it was gritty and they didn't, I mean, the special effects were actually really good for, you know, for the budget that they had. And it was just your true independent, you know, independent, you know, science fiction that's, film. That's how a lot of people are saying that it's, uh, that's where it's about to go to. Because they're going to, they might stop the uh, high-end paid uh, actors and everything. Because a lot of people aren't going to see the movies because of the uh, actor that's in it like they used to. Yeah. You know, I mean... I mean, like for us, I mean, we, you know, it, you know for this generation and, and for the, our kids, especially, you know, they got to grow up watching Robert Downey Jr. be Tony Stark. Yeah. You know, they got to see Chris Evans be Captain America. And they and they realized that that doesn't work anymore because he did Dr. Doolittle after uh, Endgame and it it didn't do too well. Well, I still like him as an actor. Yeah. I mean, he's a great actor. You know, I mean, he's just a dude. Disguised as a dude playing another dude, you know. People are finally coming up and they're like, "I can't believe he did that." I'm like, "Really?" The whole point of him doing that. And the studio even came out was like, "Really? Come on now." 
I mean, the I most wait. over I the can't. top thing in that whole film was Tom Cruise yelling into the phone, you know, bend over and fuck your own face. I mean, he goes on that whole tirade. Yeah. I, I had my kids, I had my two boys watch that movie with me just for that scene. Yes. You know, because like, you know, my, my 12 year old, he's on TikTok and so they get all those sound bites, right? And he's like, where's that from? I was like, all right, hold up. We're going to watch this. And, you know what I mean? The movie was just so bad. It was it was good kind of a thing. Yeah. It's one of those you keep going back to watch it. When we're talking about Tropic Thunder. Yeah, we're talking about Tropic Thunder, but... I can't, I can't yeah. wait to see Jamie Foxx's... Because uh, Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr. and a couple of other people are... Uh, I don't know where the movie went to or what it's called. It, it was on a... He he announced it on Joe Rogan and then I just I couldn't find it. it Jamie Fox is playing a white cop, Robert Downey Jr. is playing a Mexican, and it's just I was just I heard that I was like I'm in. I I I'm bet you in. I bet you it got sh- I I bet you the project got killed. It, mm, I th- I don't know maybe because you know again the studio still they're all too woke you know and it's like you can't sit there and make a movie like that nowadays. That's like The Office would never make it on net, uh, network TV today, not with the jokes that they, that they were that they were able to tell. It would still go well. Hey, yeah. dude, you you would it would be like a Netflix. Yeah, thing. it would. But the only thing that I really, it's like one of those people keep on telling me is like, man, you know what I wish they would do a reprisal of is, uh, uh, Wild Bunch. That's what it's called, I think. Now I'll tell you the show that I'm 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 halfway decently excited about is the uh, they're they're bringing back Night Court. Are they really? Yeah. Um, obviously, Harry Anderson's de- dead, so you know we can't we don't we won't have Harry on on the bench. But um, from the uh, Big Bang Theory, the woman that played Bernadette, mm-hmm. she's going to play Harry's daughter. John Larroquette's supposed to come back, and he's supposed to be like Uncle Dan. And he's going to be there. I don't know if he's going to be a prosecutor, if he's going to be there to like advise her kind of thing. Um, but they need to try to bring back some of the cast, man. Like Marky Post, they need to bring her back. You know, because everybody wants to know what happened with Christine and Harry after Christine went off to D.C. You know, I and 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 I, I know that this is like a little Easter egg, and it's like one of those, you know, like obscure like details about the original show but harry had a stuffed armadillo on the shelf in his chambers that needs to come back just that really that's all you get from it no 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 no. but every time every every time they were they were doing a scene in his chambers it was always that armadillo on the shelf okay it was always there anyway so i mean but that that's going to be kind of a cool show um, Dionne Warwick needs to come back. I mean, they need to, you know, because she played uh, Roz, one of yeah. the bailiffs. Obviously, Richard Mall's dead, so Bull's not going to be there. Did he die? He died. Dude, sad face. <laughs> exactly. Fuck. Why are you telling me this now? You're supposed like, to like most people that are like 500 fucking feet tall. Like Andre the Giant, Richard Mall, people who have giantism, dude, they don't last very long. I know, but you could at least, you know, you know, make it. I'm not it gonna sugarcoat gen- it for you. G- gently bring it. It's like, hey, hey, remember the I'm guy that played. I'm gonna get a strap on. I'm gonna fuck your feelings. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> yeah, I see what you did there. It was really good. All right, uh, so but yeah, I mean. Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of stuff that we can unpack in in future episodes, but, you know, kind of getting back to what we were starting with, with the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, dude, if you have not had a chance to go see this movie, definitely go take the time to go see it. Yeah. And just kind of go into it. If you haven't seen the first one, for God's sake, just rent it on Vudu or something. I think it's actually on Amazon this month. Yeah. So just watch it, you know, and, and, and then go and watch the sequel. And, and it's... It's, it's hilarious. It, it's. I mean, they didn't spend a lot of time doing backstory stuff. They just kind of like. It didn't bring me back. It, it, it still didn't top the uh, greatest comedy of all time, but it still, it was there. Are we talking about Blazing Saddles? Fuck, we're talking, talking about, about goddamn Blazing Saddles. Yes. 
So how can you how can you how can you say that Blazing Saddles? I, I never <laughs> heard anybody say Blazing Saddles was the greatest comedy of all time. Okay, that was Richard Pryor's writing, and now, it was the greatest. Here's movie. the thing. Um, very briefly, I dated a girl. I introduced her to Blazing Saddles. Okay. This relationship did not last because I'm sitting there watching this and I am laughing my ass off, right? Yeah. She gets offended. She's like, this movie is all kinds of offensive. Why are you watching it? You don't have permission to pick movies anymore. And I'm like... Well, you don't have permission to suck my cock anymore, and I find that very offensive to you. I, I'm like, I'm like, uh, really? <laughs> Where what is the, what is, what's not to like about this movie? It is so crazy. She was like the amount of racial slurs. I'm like, think about when this movie was written. Mel Brooks. Not who even is that. A, Mel the, Brooks, who is a Jew. Yeah. There's all kinds of anti-Semitic jokes in there. I mean, he, there's nothing that he left on the table. I mean, he, he all the cards were he out there. He didn't write it. It was Richard Pryor that wrote it. Right, but it was Mel. It was a Mel Brooks movie. Movie though. Yeah, he directed it. He was about to. Write, he was writing and everything, and he literally said, "It's like I can't write this movie. I'm gonna have to have a black person write this movie." Yeah, just yeah. to get just to get better thing. He. It, he now he I'm not such... gonna drop the word, but he's like nobody move or you know, you know. Yeah. Like, oh no, and he means it. He's gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god! And I it's could, funny that we talked about we're we're bringing up blazing saddles. The sheriff is near. Yeah, the sheriff is near. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that we bring up blazing saddles because I was listening to Mike Rose podcast today, and uh, he was talking about Hedley Lamar, <laughs> the actual woman, the actual right? Woman. And yeah. he was like, you know, because his 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 cousin had snuck him into his first R rated movie, and it was Blazing Saddles, right? And and he, you know, it's like he found himself laughing at jokes that he didn't get. Like it's not, it's not, uh, it's not heady. It's not heady. It's Headley. Yeah. You know, and he's like, so he goes home and asks who Headley Lamar was, and his dad goes, "What's well, the most beautiful woman in the world?" And then that she was the most genius woman in the world. Well, yes, yes, she was. Um, you can thank her for Wi-Fi. Yeah, thank her for Wi. Exactly. I mean, she. She, I mean, she, 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 she used to be okay. So she's my dream woman. Her, her real name was Hedwig, okay, and she used to be married to an arms producer in Germany or in Austria. Her husband invited all these Nazis and fascists over to the house during the '30s, and she hated them, and she would just be a fly on the wall. And um, there was one night that she was like, well, you'll have to excuse me because I need to go powder my nose. Because they were talking about, I mean, her husband was selling weapons to the Nazi party. She goes to powder her nose and nobody saw her again. She made her way to Paris where she was discovered by a French director. And then she was sent to Hollywood. And it was actually to the point where she was deemed too beautiful to speak. So she was just making these movies and not having a whole lot of speaking lines. She was there for the eye candy, right? Mm -hmm. And so she was also very intelligent, so she would spend her evenings over a drafting board. And she came up with a technology for you know uh, bouncing radio frequencies to um, uh, help the Navy defeat German U-boats. Yeah. Well, the German, I mean, the Navy was like, uh, yeah, well, if you really want to help us, why don't you use the assets that you have and go sell war bonds? So she did. She sold uh, kisses. And she raised like $28 million, or $23 million, just by selling kisses. Right? And that's like $220 million in today's money. And she used that to help drive, raise money for the war. And then comes along the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the technology that she had invented actually helped. So I was like, man, well, that's really, you know, that's she, great. Uh, you know, it's like it's, I mean, Mike Rose sitting there talking, and he's talking about, you know, he was asking his dad uh, who Hedley Lamar was. And uh, he's like, he goes, well, it's the most beautiful woman in the world. He said his mom spoke up from the back, you know, and 
He's like, well, Dad, do you have a pitcher? No, your dad does not have a pitcher. <laughs> and he's like, well, what does she look like? She looks like your mother. Now go outside and cut some wood. You'll feel better. <laughs> you know, and so he had to wait until Monday to go to the public library to look up pictures of Hedley Lamar. And he was like sitting here, he was like, oh, my God, she was, in fact, the most beautiful woman in the world. And he said it's kind of odd because he didn't really start researching her until he was like 37,000 feet in the air using the Wi-Fi she helped invent. Exactly. And I was like, man, that's just cool. So, yeah, I, I, that's why I thought it was funny that we brought up Blazing Saddles because I'm like, oh, wow, talking about like everything kind of comes full circle. It's like, I just heard about this today. So, well, I didn't hear about it. I knew about it, but it was just like I had just listened to something about it today. Because I... Uh... I'm a telepath. Whatever. Anyways. It just so doesn't work on women. Apparently. <laughs> um, All right. Well, this is another episode of What the Hell. Today's episode was for... And if, to be honest, cutting you off, if you wanted to be telepathic, if there's a movie that you want to see about men having telepathy that worked on women, Mel, Mel Gibson and What Women Want. He had, uh, I think it was Marissa Torme. Yep. Yep. So, anyways, you were saying. Uh, I'm David Dickerman. <laughs> I'm Johnny Skelton. Are we going to end every episode where you try to trump me or something like that? Because no, this is but, like uh, a going effect. Yeah, well, you know, I had this big, long conversation with my kids this weekend about whoever's trying to get the last word in and how so annoying it is. But like you were trying to say, this is what the hell. Stay classy, San Diego. Fucker. <laughs> <laughs>